Welcome back to the show where we uncover the obstacles and barriers that get in the way of getting stuff done, aka monsters and myths. Today's guest is Professor Jason Mars. Now, I met uh, Jason a couple of years ago. He was a guest on a panel that I hosted at a big financial services event called Money 2020. But our paths have crossed quite a few times at events since then. And the one that stands out for me the most was at the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas, um, where Jason unprompted got up and gave a live demonstration of his conversational AI to a jam packed room where the audience was, there was standing room only in this, uh, in this place. Mm -hmm. And anybody out there who's ever even contemplated doing a live demo of something will know that it usually doesn't end well. So when I saw Jason jump up, unprompted, unrehearsed, and he just went, right, I'm gonna show you guys what this thing does. He pulled out his phone and he gave a demo and it worked and it brought the house down. And I went, man, this guy's just risen up the ranks. He was already my hero in the world of AI. And that just catapulted him to stratospheric heights. So it is with great pleasure that I welcome Jason Mars to today's show. Jason, please tell the audience a little bit about yourself before we dive into your monsters and myths. Absolutely, and, th and thanks so much for that introduction. Uh, I remember that show, it was, uh... It was, it was so much fun. Uh, and, you know, as we were just talking about getting the energy from the audience uh, really, you know, is a special thing. I can't wait to go back to after this COVID mess. But um, a little bit about me. Um, so uh, I'm Jason Mars. Uh, um, in one life, I'm a professor of computer science uh, uh, at University of Michigan. Um, you know, I've, I've, uh, I, I've been a professor for uh, many years now, I started my career at University of California, San Diego for about a year, um, did some work on uh, scalable, sophisticated systems for applications of the future, you know, in the cloud space, in the AI space. Uh, I was then kind of poached by University of Michigan um, just a year after uh, and joined some of the luminaries uh, in the space at University of Michigan, where I've been for about seven years. Uh, along that journey, uh, you know, I've done a number of uh, uh, work, uh, works in the space, in the academic realm, right? Published a number of award-winning papers, broke some records when it comes to productivity for research, uh, but was felt kind of limited um, when it comes to the impact you can have on the world. I mean, the, the entire reason I do anything is because, you know, I want to move the needle a bit forward uh, uh, to when it comes to technology, when it comes to improving uh, the lives of everyone on the planet. Um, and so I, you know, the next step beyond the academic realm uh, was bringing that technology into the hands of every human on the planet. And so the best vehicle for that is uh, the entrepreneurship journey. Uh, and so started uh, 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 my first company, Clink, um, uh, to bring next generation conversational AI uh, to the market. Uh, observing the state of brokenness of where conversational AI is uh, at, the, at the time that I, 2015, when I started Click, it, it was about 10 years since Siri. And it seemed like we made zero progress when it comes to um, the quality of those experiences. So, uh, you know, we kind of threw in the trash uh, everything that we knew about how to build conversational AI, at least as a community, the old techniques, uh, and invented a completely new technological approach to conversational AI, brought that to market with Clink grew Clink uh, in about four and a half years from zero people to 130 people, uh, raised some record-breaking record um, rounds of funding, um, post-money valuation at 200 million uh, valuation of the company, um, tens of millions of users in the market. Uh, in fact, if you use US Bank, um, which is like the, one of the top five, top six banks in the US, uh, they have a virtual assistant in their mobile app, and that's actually built on Clink's technology. Um, and so did that uh, for a while, L had a lot of learnings on that journey as to what's going on in the market. I started Clink really with the 
with the observations and learnings from an academic perspective as to where the science could be and what are the kind of things we were inventing in the lab. After five years, four or five years uh, in market, bringing technology to market had another a sweeping set of uh, learnings about what it actually takes in industry to operationalize AI, uh, step back and have been working on the next generation of technology that I believe is gonna define the next 10 years, still somewhat in stealth mode, starting to kind of creep out. Um, but uh, there's, a, uh, there's a number of things launching this year around that new technology. Um, uh, and so now I'm embarking on a journey uh, to bring uh, the next uh, phase of AI uh, to market. So, um, you know, uh, you know, oh, wrote a book, uh, wrote a book about the Clink journey. It's called uh, Breaking Bots. Um, and, you know, it's sold hundreds of copies since launch. I'm incredibly humbled uh, that it's been able to touch uh, lives and, and also provide insights as to what it takes to bring AI to market um, uh, against the giants. Uh, what that struggle is, an origin story as to like coming out of nowhere to, to do something special uh, with technology. And so, yeah, so that's, and that's me. I, I was going to say, you, you had said there, um, what's coming next? And I'm thinking, geez, having seen firsthand what your, your um, AI did at Clink with Feeney, mm -hmm. um, the financial genie, which I still mm -hmm. love that name, um, having seen what that was capable of doing, it just absolutely was streets ahead of any of the things that when we think about AI and conversational AI, um, you know, the, the, the virtual assistants that we've got around us, they're all dumb compared to what mm -hmm. Feeney can do. And, and now you're talking about next? Jeez, um, mm -hmm. I can't wait mm -hmm. for that. That's for damn yeah. sure. So uh, in, in writing your book and along the way, and as you say, you, you took on some giants and I'm sure that working in your field, you must have come across a whole host of monsters and myths. In actual fact, mm -hmm. in working in my field, there are so many myths around AI and what it is to dispel mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I can't even imagine what it's like for you as a specialist fully immersed in there you must get this all day long. So what are your monsters and myths? Let's dive into your first one. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I'm trying to think what order should I put them in? Well, let's start with uh, one of the monsters, right? And, um, you know, one of the monsters I have to say on that journey, uh, one of the biggest challenges. So when we look around ourselves in this world, there's been so much speak and talk and noise about AI. AI is gonna change the world. AI is gonna revolutionize everything, right? And it's, it, it's interesting, right? Because when you look at your actual life, we're not seeing the outcome of that promise. We're not seeing that promise delivered, right? We can't look at our lives and say, oh my gosh, everything is AI infused. Um, and so, and, and smart, right? And, and so why is that? Well, it turns out that one of the major challenges, so we did some phenomenal things uh, at Clink to demonstrate the art of the possible as to how good a conversational AI can be, how you can speak to it with messy language, human, you don't even have to say anything it's heard before. Take turns, take it anywhere. It's flexible, resilient, it understands you, it's incredibly intelligent. Now, one of the biggest challenges there has been training, up, up, you know, operationalizing AI, an AI product uh, at a, a large enterprise or at a company. It turns out that that's, that's a journey, right? So one of the biggest uh, t technological shifts has been the advent of deep learning, right? This, this, this kind of AI that models the human brain, models all brains, neurons, uh, and be able to capture knowledge much like a human being captures knowledge, right? So that's great. But as human beings, it requires an incredible amount of training. And so in industry, when you're an, when you're an institution, uh, and you want to say, have a conversational AI, AI in-house that can in engage with the end user, it turns out to operationalize that you have to create an ecosystem of training and building. And that training and building is actually non-trivial, right? So to do it well, you would need a data science or a machine learning expert uh, that understands the nuances as to how data can affect how well these kinds of models learn. 
So this is a massive challenge. So working with numerous financial institutions and other types of institutions in, the, in automotive and in, 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 in food, uh, uh, food services, et cetera, it turns out that, that the arc of this life cycle of training these experiences uh, and bringing them to market and upgrading them is actually one of the impediments to having a wonderful experience out there. And so one of the great opportunities that not enough people are talking about right now is that just last year, just in 2020, there has been a new kind of philosophy that has been brought to market, that has been not brought to market, that has been uh, the speak of the academic circles, right? Uh, in the scientific community, there's a philosophy that was popularized by GPT-3. We'll talk about what that is in a second, but it's called zero shot learning, one shot learning and few shot learning, right? That's actually the technical uh, term that kind of been, been fused with this technique uh, by the GP3, GP3, GPT-3 academic work. Now, what is that? So this is the concept that you can take a neural network and you can train it so well on the world. You can train it generally so well that you don't have to train it to do new things, right? That's zero shot learning. That means that once it's trained, you can apply it to new problems without having to train it. One shot means you give it one example of the new task. Um, a few shot usually is three to five examples of the new task and then it knows. So it doesn't really need to be trained. Now, this is a very interesting curiosity uh, and people aren't talking about it. People, in my opinion, this is going to change the way the market sees AI for the next decade and beyond. Uh, this removes, this opportunity, this philosophy removes the, the impediment of having to train these AI and operationally, operationalizing that is incredibly hard because the talent is incredibly scarce. Even though everyone is claiming to be a data scientist, only a few really deeply understand without doing graduate work, academic research, to deeply understand the way data interacts with a model is, is not very abundant. And so building a team that can do this well, well enough for you to deliver good AI is actually uh, prohibitively challenging in many, in many cases. Now to remove the need altogether, if you were to approach AI with a zero shot uh, philosophy as an institution in the commercial realm, you remove the need for that expertise. So you can have your 70 year old small business owner building AI. You could have your marketing person that never had a computer science uh, degree also training AI because you only have to describe the task to the AI. You do not have to go through the art form of training it to be good. So, so this is this is going to change the landscape. And, and indeed, there hasn't been much commercialization of this. I mean, GP3, GPT-3 is trying to sell it and trying to kind of create this uh, API that allows folks to build upon it. But I, I believe for a number of reasons that it's not, that's not gonna work as a business model. And I'm not, I'm not aware of other efforts to take this philosophy uh, and, and, and design and build and innovate novel products, novel commercial applications of that. Uh, and so one of the things built on this AI engine that is coming to market soon is the first such chatbot ecosystem built on the idea of never having to train it and applying it to new use cases. And so this is gonna be a doozy. It's still kind of in stealth. We actually have seven customers that uh, we're actually bringing to production with this, uh, but it's all still in stealth. It's actually crazy. But, um, but I think that this is one of the big game changers uh, uh, for the future of how the industry can bring next generation AI to market. I mean, that, that is absolutely huge. I mean, and. And uh, stop me if we end up uh, disappearing down a rabbit hole here, but one of the things that I know within the field of AI, um, one of the historical problems that, that was part of that monster of training um, was, was ensuring the absence of bias because 
the training was always done on explicit data sets and often those explicit data sets would be would be inherently biased because of the humans that had actually created those data sets in the first place so so would right, yeah. this yeah. approach and philosophy <laughs> be able to help eliminate some of the inherent bias that that some previous yeah. machine learning ha has done this is awesome. That's a great question. And, and let me just direct, let me address this head on because there has been some mythology. There has been some myth mythology at play with the idea of bias in the model. Now, look, we've got to think, we've got to taxonomize these models into various categories. First, there are these generative models that, that will generate content. Let's take, a, let's take something in the NLP realm, the natural language processing realm conversational realm of AI models. So there's a cast of models, there's a cast of problems and tasks and models that will author, author content. Now, bias is a massive problem there. Actually, we saw that with Tay, right? Tay was Microsoft's, it's a bit, one of the biggest news items, Microsoft's AI that they unleashed on Twitter and then it learned from Twitter and it learned all of the worst things about humanity from Twitter because Unfortunately, there's a lot of bad stuff out there. Uh, and then and it was, it was regurgitating it. And people were explicitly, the minute they, they, right. they figured out what was happening, people were explicitly feeding it shit. Yeah, exactly. In order feeding to it make shit. it a monster, total monster. Exactly. And you know, what the beautiful thing is the analogy with a child is so good when it comes to these models, because you have to treat it, you have to safeguard it from from the bad inputs that you would want to safeguard your child from. You wouldn't want your five-year-old to watch like the goriest horror film because then all of a sudden, you know, who knows? Uh, and similar with these models. Okay, so you have these generative models, right? That will create content. Bias is a massive issue there. That's one class. Then you have these class classification models, these models that, that, that really are selecting. So in a conversational AI context, you could think of intent classification as selecting, well, what's the intent? And then you can generate a response based on that intent. Now, not generate, you can select a response. So many conversational AI systems out there and AI systems out there will essentially do a classification task where it's just selecting from potential outputs. Those potential outputs are defined by humans. So one way to quickly be sure that bias isn't a, a, a massive problem is to be able to constrain the application of AI such that the options of those selections are good, are curated. So, you know, it'll only say back in the context of conversational AI, it'll only say back good things, right? So you can say, well, here are the answers to 10 questions, okay? And I'm gonna make sure that I author the, what, it's, what those answers are. So I have a guarantee that this conversational AI is only going to repeat one of these 10 things. And then you have a classification that selects from the 10 things. There, in that case, your, your model isn't generating text. So then the important thing is, you know, for any of the technical folks out there that might be, Jason, I want you to tell the whole story. The important thing is, well, the, then, then the bias is constrained to cases where you might, let's say you have, uh, you know, 10 things and one says, one of the things is, oh, this is absolutely amazing what the world is like. And then you have another selection. This is the worst thing in the world. Then if you ask a question like, what do you think about black people? And if it selects, oh, this is the worst thing in the world. You know, you can have these canned responses for which you can, you might be able to get the, get the model to appear to have bias. Uh, and and you, you might have to be thoughtful about that. But let me just say clearly, in the realm of conversational AI, when you're building a, a chat bot or a virtual assistant, if you are defining the set of things that that experience can say in a constrained way, and it's not writing new content for you, you, you eliminate 90% of the concern when it comes to uh, when it comes to bias. And so in industry, in production systems, that's all you want to do. You know, Asterix Tay, Tay was an academic experiment. It wasn't really a product. It just came from Microsoft, but it was an intellectual experiment 
that happened to have Microsoft attached to it. So Microsoft, it was a doozy for them. But uh, it wasn't really a, a product or a production system um, that's a key product of the Cub company. But that's, long story short, that's how we constrain the possibility for biases by making sure that the space of what could be said by a conversational AI is specified and not authored by the conversational AI. So that's limited rather. So it's, it's, it's knowledge may be vaster than it's, it's ability yeah. to respond kind of a thing. Exactly. But exactly. I, lo I love the idea of zero shot philosophy and, and right. that I, I'm sure that that will, that will be revolutionary to a lot of companies who are, who have been holding back, uh, facing that monster of training. Cause as you say, right. that's, that, that's, uh, I don't know whether it's been mythical or whether it's been real in the, well, certainly from our perspective, it's been real in the past that this has been a huge undertaking. And, and I have a friend who has deployed a, a conversational chat bot um, in another organization. As a matter of fact, he is my first guest on the show. Um, he did it in a, in a customer experience uh, um, context. And, and one of his things was, geez, they spent months and a huge amount of resource um, on, on training and, and feeding it the right data and, and refining and things like that. So, right. right. And often, yeah. And often after that training, you still have something that's not, not that great. And then when you actually want to update the experience, you want to give it more capabilities, then you have to do that cycle again. And it takes, in my experience, just watching the largest financial institutions in the world, your JPMs, everything from JPMC to Wells Fargo to um, uh, US Bank to all of these uh, large institutions. Uh, it takes about, there's this life cycle about nine to 18 months to go through a whole training to get a robust experience. And so it's just untenable. Um, yeah. Great monster to kick off with. Can't wait for the next one now. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's, um, so the next monster, um, and, and, you know, I can't, I can't emphasize how game changing, you, you see the game changing thing about, let me just say before I talk about the next monster, the game changing thing about this kind of new philosophy, this, this philosophy of, of zero shot learning, um, which really kind of is a natural explorative point from transfer learning. Of course you start with transfer learning and then all of a sudden it's like, well, can we just zero shot it, right? So uh, a natural, uh, Challenge. The reason why you see there's this gap between the art of the possible that scientists look at, and then the practical world, and so even though in a lab you might be able to do something interesting, making that a scalable thing from the capacities of companies, companies are like people, they have a capability of what they can and can't do, and you you have a you have a distribution you have a normal distribution of that. And so you look at the main quartiles of that distribution, and it turns out that if you, if you are out of that band and capability of what a company can do, your technology will not change the world because it cannot scale. So, so, so zero shot, it puts AI into that band because it takes the hard part out. Now there's another potential game changer that people, kind of know about in the back of their minds, but they don't realize it from my perspective, from my observations, they don't realize that this is going to change technology into the future for at least a decade and beyond, right? And that is GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, okay? Fancy scientific term, but what is that? Well, there's a, oh my gosh, and Ian Goodfellow, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a brilliant dude. Like this guy needs a Turing Award, by the way. Uh, he, he's a um, uh, you know he's a machine learning um, researcher academician who literally wrote the textbook on deep learning. Literally, the best textbook I'm aware of on deep learning was written by this guy, and he also uh, uh, is the guy that really brought to discovered slash invented GANs, generative adversarial networks. Now, what is this thing? This thing's going to change. So people have seen it. Uh, there's been a lot of excitement recently around. Uh, and you got to see the pictures of this. There are computers, there are AI models that will generate a face yeah. from nothing, will create a face and you cannot tell 
that it's, it's, it's drawing it pixel by pixel from scratch, a fictitious human being. And it's impossible to tell that this was not a real picture of a human, right? It looks like a real picture. You gotta see it. Google it if you need to see it. You gotta see it. I actually and then use, yeah, yeah. I use uh, the site called thispersondoesnotexist.com, uh, which is based on that technology um, because I often need um, people personas yes. to use as examples. And I actually, yes. the minute I read about uh, the, the, the whole project and, and, and the kind of a capability, I dive <laughs> straight in going, I need this because I need to be able to use pictures of people yes. without worrying about copyright or privacy. And these guys actually say, you're welcome to use any of our, our pictures because they're all computer generated. They're not real people. Yeah. So, yeah. And this is, this is key, guys. This part, you, you have to, anyone listening to this has to Google, this person does not exist. I'm there right now, I'm looking at the faces. This is the GAN's work that I'm talking about. The way you know it's a GAN, the one thing you can tell that this is a computer is you look at the ears. Get a picture where there's two ears and look at the earlobes. Usually that's the giveaway. But when you see these pictures, your brain will explode that a computer drew this from scratch pixel by pixel, your brain will explode. The reason why this works well is because of this key idea, brilliant idea, Turing Award deserving idea, in my opinion, of you take a neural network, a typical neural network, the standard neural network you would use for facial recognition or something, classic you know, tech, and then you have another neural network, another AI that's literally challenging it's training via you know it's like a sparring partner training right so you can train wax on wax off mr miyagi style karate kid reference mr miyagi style wax on wax off but you can also train with a sparring partner and if you spar every day for a year with a really good sparring partner you're gonna get good well the sparring partner analogy is is what i'm describing with gans you have another neural network that's challenging your neural network. How does it challenge it? It's taking a real picture. Just This is just a simplification, but it's taking a real picture and it's saying, hey, neural network, I know you have a real picture there. I'm going to secretly randomly dis disrupt, disturb a couple of these pixels and I want you to tell me which pixels are fake or not. And you run this over and over and over again. And you tell it, oh, you were wrong. These were the fake pixels. Oh, you were wrong. These were the fake pixels. And your neural network is learning how to tell when you, when you disturb something real to make it just a little bit fake. And it learns it a billion times. And so it's sparring. And then it starts to get good at protect, predicting the fake stuff. So what happens in your neural network that you're training by a sparring partner is that neural network then learns something. And here's the magic of deep learning. We can't pinpoint what it learns, just like we can't pinpoint the concept of Apple in particular neurons in your head. It's some combination of the interaction of neurons that you know what an Apple is in your head. It's not like neuron number 57 and 58 is the Apple neurons, right? So it's learning it in this deep learning kind of way, but it's getting, it's learning the something. And that something, then you take that neural network and you say, okay, now draw me a picture. Now you know what real looks like because you, it's crammed into your neurons. Draw me a pixel. Okay, uh, draw me a picture. And then it draws ridiculous picture. Go to that website to see the picture now. Okay, let me get to my point. This has been, this is an exciting result and it was first popularized by the computer vision applications. However, we're just coming upon understandings of how this might apply to natural language processing, right? And so you've got something like GPT-3 uh, uh, and basically it was trained with the internet. This is an idea, I haven't seen it tested much. There's a paper called Electra from 2020. This is all hot new stuff that's going to change the world. Uh, so Google did this Electra work. That's really the first, the first real experimentation of this sparring partner approach to training natural language processing neural networks. 
So the thing is with this kind of approach, right? The, the fancy thing about um, GPT-3, which did not use this approach is that it can author articles from scratch. And those articles are hard to distinguish whether it was a human or a computer that wrote it. It's just really good generated stuff. That, that model GPT-3 was trained and the, the, was trained with the entire internet. It cost $4.5 million to train it once. OpenAI did this and then Microsoft licensed it for like a billion dollars. Just check the, check the news. So this is a behemoth model that was trained with the whole internet and it does a pretty good job writing original articles. However, what if we were to take the similar approach? Let's take a, a GANs based approach and take a smaller model and you spar it. You take real articles and you perturb, perturb some of it and you train into submission this model. Could you have an ability to generate content that's indistinguishable just like these pictures are indistinguishable? What if we did that? What if we built interesting systems in the language space based on that philosophy? The first work that I think really does a good job as a treatise to this concept was is very recent and it's the Electra paper from Google. And I believe there needs to be more work there. That's some work that I care about deeply. And I believe that that's going to change the production landscape. The problem with GPT-3 is that it's not practical in general at scale. It's $4.5 million of compute cycles to train. It's a massive, massive model. It doesn't fit in a normal computer. But, but if you were to leverage the same thing that this person doesn't exist use for, for the language space, you can get smaller models, better to wield. Let's, let's couple that with a zero shot philosophy. Let's train it so well that it doesn't need to be trained ever again for new tasks. What can happen then? I think that these two concepts, Zero shot learning, and then this sparring partner GAN's approach to the to AI is going to revolutionize the entire industry. Not a lot of people. I am not aware of anyone talking about it in that in that sense. This is the future. Forget everything you already know. This is what we should be working on. But this is this is when I think this is going to be the, the the turning point for us actually starting to see AI operationalized by the market in a way that enhances our lives for real. And I'm well, working on it, so. <laughs> I, I was gonna say, so what's the monster that was being overcome by by GANs? Was that, your, that wasn't your second monster, was it? Well, well, yeah, Where's so GANs. Because because some of my right. audience might think that actually GANs, GANs are the monster. monster. No, 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 because, yeah, GANs are the <laughs> <laughs> Because, I see. because I, immediately the, re the reason why um, uh, uh, a lot of people get scared of uh, the website like um, this person does not exist.com is because of the whole deep fake thing. And I mean, we, we've mm -hmm. seen so many ultra realistic deep fakes with face swaps mm -hmm. and things like that. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've seen, uh, you know, Donald Trump videos and uh, Boris Johnson videos of them saying stuff that they never ever said, where, where people are now having to question. And there was a, um, oh, yeah. I forget what the name of the TV show was here in the UK. There was a whole uh, TV show that was built around, it was a, a fictional thing, um, but it was built around this whole concept of uh, the police using deep faked CCTV footage to uh, convict uh, somebody of a crime that they never ever yeah. did, and things oh like. Oh my gosh! You know, so that is the yeah. You know, so no, yeah. so what was the monster that was being overcome by Gans? Well, to clarify well, for well, people that Gans isn't the monster. Yeah, well, so okay, Gans is a technology. That that's a lot. The 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 idea of the sparring partner approach to AI, uh, and you know. Uh, so that's a technique, right? Now there's there's a couple monsters. The monster is the monster I was referring to, and I want to talk about your monster because that's really interesting. But the monster I was referring to uh, is is the idea. Really, I didn't really mention it very well. But the monster is these these models are getting so big. You know, the the models that we're starting to hit diminishing returns with more data training certain models of certain sizes that we're kind of we're kind of getting to this place where these the ai is not learning as much as it can and this is an approach to to scale what you can tr train these models like how well you can, there's no other approach i'm aware of 
beyond GANs that can get a computer to draw a face like, you know, like the ones we see on the, on the so it's really how do we take get to the next generation? And plus with a GPT-3, how do we get something like GPT-3 in a way that it's practical? Because right now it's not practical for, for mass consumption uh, by the world. You can't have a billion queries that are GPT-3 kind of queries because the model is just too big and it has the whole internet in it. It's, it's bigger than the internet. So, so that's that monster, it's a technical monster. And then there's a promise of what the good you can do with games. Like for instance, in the vision space, if I'm building a video game and I have to draw non-playing characters, like I need a hundred fake people in my video games, to have an artist draw a hundred people is gonna be incredibly hard. And then they'll all start looking the same because your, your artist is tired. But if you can use a technology like the vision, you know, GAN based, um, uh, uh, generation of faces, then, then of course you can have positive applications like that. But you're absolutely right. Of course, this technology can be used for evil. And especially now when we're incredibly vulnerable, society is more vulnerable as it's ever been because we live through digital means, right? And this even predates COVID. COVID just accelerated it. Today, what reality is comes digitally through pictures and, and text. That's reality for everyone, pretty much, almost, right? I mean, reality beyond the five people at work and the 10 people over here. And that general reality as to what's going on in society comes through digital means primarily. And now you can create artificial content, both images and text that are indistinguishable from something written by a real human being. So we're vulnerable to that. So that is a monster. And just like, and I'll use the classic analogy, just like, you know, nuclear technology, it could be used for good and evil. You can build power plants with it or you can blow up a, a wor the world with it. We have, a, we have a similar thing with AI in the digital realm. We can blow up the digital world with AI or we can do good things that help us, um, you know, uh, improve the world uh, with these technologies. So that monster is 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 a monster. The, the monster you're discussing is a monster for public policy folks uh, to to grapple with. But you know, the problem with public policy folks is they're not very technically. They're typically not very technically sound, <laughs> or like sharp. So it's a challenge. I don't know. There's a whole lot. <laughs> to go into there on on ethics and and mm -hmm. things like that I'm, I'm right at the moment in the middle of generating my own content not using again uh <laughs> i'm writing a blog post um that that was the inspiration came from another interview that i'd done where i was introduced to a new quote um from a french philosopher i, I can't remember how it long time ago um, where he, uh, the, part of the quote says, when you invent the ship, you also invent the shipwreck. And it was about the consequences of uh, innovation and invention, mm -hmm. creating something new, particularly when it's technology, mm -hmm. carries with it the danger, the burden of how that technology could potentially be used for bad um and and this is something i, I literally i've been been contemplating <clears throat> and rewriting and redrafting um because I, I i want to do the concept justice and and there's a whole lot mixed in there around um codes of ethics and and just because we can doesn't mean to say that we should and things like that but i won't i won't divert on because i know that you also have a myth for us and i know we we're coming up on burning up a lot of your time here so so oh, no worries no worries one is the myth <laughs> yeah no i mean you know the myth to me uh you know that um i think is really relevant to um operationalizing ai is is has to do with uh the idea that when you build an ai product you can you can think about approaching that journey with the same that an AI company is a tech company, right? Or a, a team 
to produce an AI product needs to be a technical team. Uh, I think that unlike, there's been a number of revolutions and I talk about this very deeply uh, uh, in my book. Chapter four of my book is all about this, but, but uh, it turns out that during the internet revolution, the late 2000, the dot-com boom, you needed software engineers for that, right? In the mobile boom, because there's been a couple of these booms, right? The mobile app, now we have apps for everything, mobily. In that boom, you needed software engineers. Primarily, that was the fuel. In the AI realm, software engineering is, uh, is, is, is much like what the PMs are for a previous uh, tech company. What you need for an AI innovation company are folks that are inventors, that are researchers, that are, you need to have a core nugget of problem solvers that, that end up being researchers, right? Because, and then, and then you have to construct your operational model around the, the, the transfer, the tech transfer from those researchers into your product. So, you know, what, traditionally, when you look at Microsoft research, Intel research, IBM Watson research lab, AMD research, all of these research labs, or maybe AMD not so much, but all of these research labs, usually they're kind of these tack-ons, right? So you have your company that Microsoft does Windows and Microsoft Office, and then you have a research lab that's go explore, whatever, if something interesting is there, we'll protect the IP and maybe we'll productize it, maybe. 90% of the time, uh, we don't productize anything. Um, a 10% of the times we do, like the Xbox Connect was one of the famous things, but, but you can chop off that research lab and Microsoft will be just fine. Indeed, Microsoft has a, had a rule, I don't know if it's still there, that that research lab is only be 1% of the capital expenditure of the company or something like that, right? Um, so, but, but to have an AI company, you, that needs to be, that's the most indispensable portion. And the entire operational model needs to be around transferring the technology out of that. Why is that? And that's because every new feature requires research. To construct a new model, to evaluate the possibility of an existing model solving a new problem, to, to reason about the tuning of those hyperparameters in your model. The engineering work is, is, is about discovery uh, and it requires the expertise of a researcher in that uh, engineers learn to build software and that's very different than training a model. Training a model is a dark art. Uh, it, it's not, there's no systematic process for, for training a model and guaranteeing some kind of result, right? If I'm gonna add a button to my website, uh, I can systematically say, add button, use this tool, blah, blah, blah. Button's gonna be there, estimated time, blah. For, for AI capabilities, if you wanna be able to solve some intrinsic AI problem, every single feature, every single invention requires research. And so you have to rethink how you organize your companies around that. And I, I think one of the biggest myths, myths in the market in general is that, oh yeah, let's spool up a, a company to do something in AI. And that can be primarily an engineer. You can reason about it like a typical tech company or an organization in the thing, but you have to rethink the entire org structure and how the, the feature roadmap, you know, how do you operationalize that feature roadmap? What's the processes that need to be reinvented to allow for flexibility and timeline to getting something discovered uh, and re-engineer that entire view. And that's if you wanna really move the needle forward. Um, so we see that there's thousands of companies that are just vaporware. And I think the real ones will, will have in it real researchers and a process and operational model to get that research into product. And, and I'm assuming, um, although you're talking about AI company, exactly the same is applied to departments within organizations that want Correct. to deploy an AI in an operational yeah. manner to yeah. do anything. Deploying an AI in an organization is not simply 
getting a whole lot of techies and buying something off the shelf and plugging it in. And I think yeah. that is, it's, it's wrapped up in your myth in terms of, because I've written your myth down as AI company as a tech company. It's the same thing to me that a, a department that is considering or, or has been charged with deploying AI mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. solve a problem in a company, tech is almost, tech is the execution side but the first part comes with a whole lot of understanding and, as you say, research. And, and I would like to offer that, particularly in an AI company, you might challenge me on this, but I think people with a philosophy and anthropology background are also necessary within your mix of people. Because a lot of the time you're trying to train or create an AI to reproduce patterns or behaviors of humans and unless you've got a deep understanding of humans and what they've been doing your AI is never ever going to mimic that it's just going to be a, a, a robot you know RPA at best something like that that's just repeating a a set of instructions I mean would you advise companies the same thing as as what you say you know companies to create departments in that manner yeah, so that makes a lot of sense, especially in the realm of understanding the UI, to understanding the design of capabilities and features and the way that a human should engage. So, so when it comes to that realm of what should it be like? So there's the, there's the realm of technically, what can I train into this brain? <laughs> you know what I mean? What can I get this brain to learn? That's one thing, but then, what should, what should it be like? You know, if I'm building a conversational AI, if I'm building a robot, how should this robot really be like from a design standpoint? I think, I think that's your anthropo anthropologists and your philosophers are incredibly, could be incredibly helpful in, in creating that connection. So, so sociologists as well um, uh, uh, could be incredibly relevant for understanding how should it, how should this being engage with the world, right? And behave in the world. I think, I th so I think there's an important realm of the product life cycle uh, for which that plays a, a key role. Jason, I, this has been a, a unbelievably fantastic interview with you. Awesome. We, we've awesome. hit 47 minutes at the moment. So <laughs> the interests of the show, uh, I'm going to bring it to a close, but I, I would highly encourage people to seek you out, to come and follow your work and to, to understand more. Uh, to me, you are, I, I know you refer to the person who wrote the textbook, but I don't know them, I know you. And to me, you're the guiding <laughs> star that I always look, you're my North Star in this world of, of, of AI. Um, yeah. where, uh, what's the best way for people to reach you? Uh, and, and I'll drop the links in the show notes and things like that, but is it LinkedIn yeah. or your own personal website? Yeah, or Clink yeah, or yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's um, jasonmars.org. Uh, so that's a good vehicle to kind of connect to what's going on, what I'm up to. Um, of course, LinkedIn and, and Facebook and Twitter. Um, so you can get links to all that from, from, the, uh, from the main website. Um, I'm happy to engage, man, to shoot me questions, ask me anything. I'm happy to kind of learn more and uh, engage with everyone. Yeah. Fantastic. And of course, go and buy Jason's book. Read it. First. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That too. <laughs> that too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Jason, thank you so much for coming on the show today. And I'm so looking forward to our paths meeting in real life again sometime soon. Cool. Me too. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah.